8888. The password is convention 2888. For today's Japanese simultaneous interpretation, we will use Doom's language interpreter function. Participants will be, able, will be able to select the language they wish to listen to. At today's Q&A session, please post your question on the Q&A function of Zoom. We would like to pick up questions from on-site participants first from the floor. So please note that we cannot address all questions from, the, from Zoom. And lastly, we have Twitter hashtag for today's event. The hashtag is hashtag HBC2022. The hashtag is two the hashtag is HBC2022. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please wait for a while until the program begins. So thank you for waiting and good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for coming to uh, this alumni showcase at HBC Kyoto today. It's my great pleasure to be your host and moderator for today's event and to be able to have your all attendance at HBC Kyoto today. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Haruka Hashimoto, the CEO of Convararia Limited, and I usually serve as an advisor and a business strategy consultant for startups and venture capitals in the biotech and healthcare field. It's really a beautiful day in Kyoto today. So in this beautiful season of Kyoto, we are honored to have special guests from Milan, Italy, and from Boston, US. HVC Kyoto is now in its seventh year. We would like to thank all of the entrepreneurs, mentors, partner companies, and all of you who attended and watched online. Today, entitled, entitled Alumni Showcase Regenerative Medicine, we invited three powerful startups. In addition, our expo of Milan, Italy, will introduce the MIND Milano Innovation District, a science park developed on the site of the former expo. Our expo and Kyoto Research Park has, a, has concluded an MOU the other day. In the panel discussion, Global leaders in the healthcare ecosystem and the guests from BioRabs Boston US will discuss about the building of ecosystem in Kyoto. Now, we would like to begin our program with an opening remark by Mr. Hideki Sho, Chief Director of Japan External Trade Organization Kyoto. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Hideki Sho. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Distinguished guests, guests from abroad, participants, everyone, Koyanagi Sensei, good afternoon. I am Hideki Sho, Chief Director of Jetro Kyoto. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to say a few words at the opening of HVC, Healthcare Venture Conference, post event in. 2022. First, I sincerely thank all the people who attended HVC on July 5th this year. The HVC Kyoto, now in its seventh year, featured 15 finalists, carefully selected from 23 companies in seven countries who had passed the first round of competition. These 15 finalists gave their pitch in the conference, followed by open mentoring by 10 professionals with extensive experiences. We also successfully organized 71 individual meetings with 20 potential business partners, including our event partners. A total of 430 people participated online this year making it a very worthwhile event. The reason why the HVC has been able to continue for seven years is that the HVC has not been a single event in a year, but rather a series of post-events like today's one, 
with covering the same theme through a year. Japan is focusing on fostering life science startups on the national level. At today's post event, HBC alumni will share their success stories and business development with us so that more startups will be able to take tips and the information to help them succeed. JETRO, my organization, has been supporting Japanese startups to expand overseas through various programs, and at the same time, global startups to expand their business in Japan as well. This year, we are planning to nurture Japanese startups in collaboration with the world's top accelerators. Uh, we aim to transfer global top-level know-how to local authorities and domestic VCs, and in addition, an acceleration program in collaboration with domestic and overseas university is planned to support university-based startups and promote the ongoing networking between universities. I'd like to conclude my remarks by wishing that today's HVC post event will provide an opportunity for more startups to expand their business overseas, promote collaboration, and further develop the life science ecosystem in Kyoto. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Hideki Shou. Now let's start the first section. Uh, the uh, the Araxpo of Miran will introduce the MIND Miran Innovation District. Please come to the podium, Mr. Alberto Mina. Okay, thank you very much. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Alberto Mina. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to our partners of the TRP, particularly the president Atsuko Kadonaki and all the team of the TRP. So it's really a great pleasure and honor to spend this time with you. In, in order to introduce my um, speech, I would like to ask if it's possible to launch a brief video. There is a place on earth where the desire for welfare and development can be given concrete answers. A place where life sciences will help build a world of innovation, well-being, and sustainability. This place is at the heart of Europe, in Italy, and goes by the name of MIND. In the large area which hosted Expo Milano 2015, our Expo, the state-owned company which is the landlord, and Lend Lease, a preeminent Australian real estate group, are defining a new development for the entire site to build the city of the future, an ecosystem that puts the human dimension at the center. MIND is the first major case of a public-private partnership in Italy. Thanks to the involvement of Lendlease, the operation envisages a total investment of approximately 4 billion euros. This partnership has already created a cluster of 32 companies to support an innovation ecosystem with a main focus on science. Federated Innovation, the name of the initiative, aims to be a unique model of collaboration between large companies, small businesses, startups, universities and research centers, and already has more than 300 players connected. 
The Human Technopole is a national hub and center of reference for life science research. Its mission is to improve human health and well-being, including healthy aging. It aims at developing predictive and personalized medicine to treat cancer, cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. The University of Milan, La Statale, is a large multidisciplinary international university. The university campus in mind will be developed as a world-class scientific and technological center with a holistic approach to the nexus energy, food, wellness, environment, and a close interaction between exact sciences, natural sciences, and health sciences. The IRCCS Galeazzi is a leading orthopedic hospital in Italy and Europe. It carries out the largest number of hip and knee joint replacement operations and spinal operations in Italy. Furthermore, all types of disorders of the musculoskeletal system are treated. The IRRCCS Galeazzi is particularly active in the introduction of technology and innovation, both regarding diagnostics and assistance. Fondazione Triulza, together with all the partners, are creating the Social Innovation and Sustainable Development Lab Hub in Cascina Triulza, in the challenge of building a better world from the point of view of justice, rights, and the environment. MIND is an innovation ecosystem, a catalyst for social and economic growth, a hub for the creation of knowledge, the involvement of companies, and the growth of startups. A place where digital technologies enhance connections, the exchange of knowledge, and improve people's life. A place to live. A place to be. Thank you. So you have an overview here from what is our ecosystem, which is the legacy of the big event of, um, of the Expo 2015, which was so successful for our country and also positive as outputs in relationship around the world. So uh, here we are presented the main, what we call the main anchors, which are all focused on life science. A huge and important research center called Human Technopole, which is funded by the national government with 1.5 billion euros over the next 10 years. And at the moment, he is implying 300 researchers and will reach the number of 1,000. This is really important because it's a national agency which is particularly um, rich as inf infrastructure for research and facilities and laboratories. Secondly, as we have seen, the campus of the new, new campus of the University of Milan, which is one of the best ranked in Italy. 20,000 students approximately will be there in st starting from the 2025. And in the hospital Galeazzi, have you seen, is specialized in orthopedics and also cardiovascular disease. So we call these public anchors in sense that are or state-owned or in any case delivering public services. But on the other side, we establish a very strong partnership with a private partner, which is the Australian developer called Land Lease, which is one of the key players in the world in uh, renovation and reshaping parts of cities with approximately 100 billion uh, Australian dollars of pipeline in the next years around the world. So a good, a strong partner. With him, we are developing a long-term project because he has, with our expo, a concession for one century. Our expo, the company I belong to, is a state-owned company and in some sense is the director of the orchestra, in this case, of the ecosystem. We are particularly aimed in order to keep together all these public anchors and the private investment. And in order to do so, what we are particularly 
focus on is to keep the, and to bear the risk for permits with the public institutions because we are shared by the national government, the regional government, and the municipality of Milan. So we offer an entry point to the local and national institutions. And you know, for company working on life science, healthcare, medical systems, this is very important to have an access to the regulators and the lawmakers. So we offer that and bear also the risk of the permits in order to develop in the right time all the area. Land lease by its side is creating a platform, a business platform, open to all kinds of companies Called, the platform is called Federated Innovation. Federated Innovation is a legal entity, and the aim of this entity is to create a sort of platform to cooperate in order to compete. So cooperation also among competitors in different fields, and the different fields are of two main areas. City of the future, because we are building in the, our site 100 hectare, a sort of a new city. But on the other side, life science, because as you have seen, we have in the site three real powerhouses on life science research. So as you know, private capitals and companies are looking for talents and regulatory system which can be affordable in sense that can be reachable and a point of reference in the relationship of development of research systems and new products. So these are the companies that are already engaged in the federated innovation. I mentioned all of some of the most famous, for instance, AstraZeneca, as you probably know, or uh, Nippon Gases coming from Japan, ABB, Schneider, so in the different fields. The idea is to invest in creating project and innovation in the different fields. This is interesting because at this moment, the area of the site of our district is developed only for the 20%. So we have the hospital already done, the human research uh, center, which is a uh, human technopole, which is operating yet, but the majority of the area is a building area. But these companies are already engaged without renting any square meters. It means that it's not a matter of real estate, but it's a matter of sharing a vision and a project of innovation. And to keep open connections with young talents, public institutions, and capitals. This is particularly important in our system and, of course, we are orienting our activities as public actors to, creating, to create possibilities for attract capitals for startups or for uh, new companies. And this is why we are particularly proud of uh, a cooperation with Skydeck. Skydeck is, as probably you know, one of the biggest accelerator program in the world, based, launched by the Berkeley University in California. And they decided to put the only external point from the valley in mind. And the interest to be in mind is the possibility to gather there new ideas and startups for new companies coming and also stemming from this ecosystem. This is only the first. This is the exit and the output of the first uh, uh, call that we have done three months ago. And have you seen, uh, uh, answered and um, did the application, 547 cases, companies, and then we are in the short list of nine of them in order to be accelerated by the program of Skydeck, and we launched this program on October. But this is also the first step. We are also creating a new technology transfer led by ourselves, our expo, with the main public hospitals of the region, 
Lombardy region is the leader in Lombard in Italy for healthcare system innovation and research on these fields. And you understand which is really a powerhouse, the accessibility to the data of the four main IRCCS, so research and treatment hospitals of the system and of the region. The technology transfer will be um, a, new oper a new project that we are going to launch in the next two months. So, at the end of my presentation, I will only recall the reason we, why we are here. Because we think and we are deeply convinced that it is impossible to develop a great innovation without partnerships. And we are so happy that the Kyoto Research Park has become one of our international partners. And the idea is to establish with the different partners a stable cooperation in sense to create stable bridges that could uh, support the communication and exchange of capitals and talents. As you see from this map, we have a cooperation already also in uh, Canada, in Quebec particularly, in Michigan with the Ann Arbor Science Park based in, uh, uh, in uh, Ann Arbor, the Michigan uh, US Science Park, and then with the Switzerland, Tsinghua University in China, and KRP here in Japan. So the idea is that creating a place of innovation means to give a platform the access for a country. So we are a platform which, con which permits to be in contact with all the Italian systems. On the other side, we are attracting investment in order to create the best condition for innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, Chris, we would like to, we would like to have some one questions. Are there any questions from the floor? Okay. So thank you again for the presentation. So now we would like to move on to the next session. So next session will, is the alumni session. The next session, uh, next presenter is from Ms. Ami Okuno, the manager at Business Development Department at Metocera Inc., who took the stage of HBC Kyoto 2019. Thank you very much. So please give a warm welcome to Ms. Okuno. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction. I'm Ami Okuno. I'm a member of business development at Metsela. So today I'd just like to give you a quick introduction about what we do at Metsela. So Metsela is a clinical stage biotech startup um, founded in 2016. And actually, we have a picture of our headquarter in Kawasaki. We actually have an office in Icon as well. And Biolabs and Icon just recently uh, announced the collaboration. So I'd love to you know, work together in the future. Um, and we focus on novel and pro proprietary technologies in cardiology and fibrosis at the moment. And we're a bit unique for a Japanese company. Um, especially a biotech company in a sense that we recently acquired another Japanese regenerative medicine company called JRM earlier this year. So with this acquisition, we currently have two clinical pipelines. Um, shown in green as JRM001. It's in phase three clinical trial in Japan targeting small but very critical um, pediatric congenital heart disease. And on the other hand, we have MTC001, which is in phase one clinical trial, targeting the big ischemic heart failure market. And as you can see, these are very diverse um, pipelines that we have internally. And in, internally, we have an R&D team that's working on discoveries of seed and um, development of new pipelines, but we're also open to collaborations with different universities, both domestically as well as internationally. So I want to go into a little bit about uh, a little bit about our two clinical pipelines. Um, first, JRM001, 
as I mentioned, targeting the pediatric congenital heart disease, namely single ventricles. So these patients are born with one functioning ventricle, whereas in a typical human, uh, there's usually the two, the right and the left ventricles that's pumping the blood throughout the body. So um, with, because of this uh, malformation of the heart, these patients have a hard time um, surviving, and these patients usually have to go through one to two surgical repairs of their heart um, to improve the circulation and hemodynamics. And recently, with the significant improvement of the medical care and medical standard, had led to a rapid increase in the number of adult patients who were actually born with these congenital diseases, but they live to the age of 20 and over. So long-term efficacy is in critical needs for these diseases. And that's where our JRM001 comes in. It's our next generation treatments for these rare cardiac diseases. And what's unique about JRM001 is that even though it's an autologous therapy, so using patients' own cells, we do not need any extra um, invasion or surgery to retrieve the starting material or administering the cells. So the biopsy is coupled with a typical surgical procedures that these patients have to go through. And the administration of the cells are usually done via catheter during a routine cardiac catheter examinations. And as I mentioned, we're in phase three clinical trial. We've seen long-term efficacy from our phase one and phase two clinical studies that was done at Okayama University. And as you can see, we followed up these patients for over two years, and we've seen significant improvement in efficacy as well as improvement in the incidence of adverse events. So we're very hopeful that these, uh, the, this program advances to phase three and hopefully uh, commercialization in the near future. Next, on to MTC001. So this is targeting chronic heart failure. And I want to give you a little bit of background and share a little bit about our, the power of our cell, which we call VCF. Um, so on, the, on your left, you can see that when you make a little scarring to the heart of a neonatal or fetal mice, these mice's heart have the capacity to regenerate itself. And as the mice grows old, older, these in, um, scars tend to heal itself. However, this regenerative capacity is not actually seen in adult mice. So when you make a scarring to the heart, these scars form fibrosis, and it even leads to ischemic heart failure. And this is the kind of disease progressions that we see in, in adult humans when they go through heart attack or myocardial infarction. So we wanted to figure out what, what was the reason for this regenerative capacity. And we focused on fibroblasts. There's actually different kinds of fibroblasts in the heart. And we focused on VKIN1 positive and CD90 positive cardiac fibroblasts. So as you can see on the top right here, there is a huge number of VKIN1 and CD90 double positive cells in fetal, fetal cardiac uh, fetal mice. However, this is actually not seen in adult mice. So we figured this may be the key to the regenerative capacity that we saw in neonatal or fetal mice. And next, we, up, upon um, extensive research, we also figured out a way to transform these negative, double negative cells to express VKIN1 and CD90 surface markers through two simple steps of cell sorting and cytokine stimulations. So with that, we initiated our phase one clinical trial, first in class combination cell and device therapy, which we're calling MTC001. So again, this is an autologous therapy. Um, we're taking biopsy from the patient via a catheter from the healthy part of the heart. We expand, we sort, and stimulate the cells. We freeze down, and we deliver that back into patient using a novel catheter that we co-developed with a Japanese catheter company. And what's unique about this catheter is that it connects to a 3D mapping system, which is often used in ablation treatments. So the doctors, the interventionists or cardiologists can see the heart in 3D in real time and figure out where best to inject these cells. Because if you inject these cells in a healthy part of the heart, what's really the point? 
So those were a quick intro about our clinical pipelines, but we also have other uh, very early stage but ongoing research for other cardiac indications as well as um, organs like kidney and lungs. And our fundraising record, I think we, as mentioned earlier, we presented back in 2019. So since then, we've completed our Series B and Series C round. Series C, we closed earlier this year, raising a total of $14 million. And we have plans on conducting pre-IPO round uh, for the next year to further accelerate the development of our clinical as well as the preclinical pipelines. The company was founded by two co-founders. Taka, on your left, is our founding scientist, and he's ru now running our R&D team and, tr um, and uh, investigating really what is the mechanism of action of our cells. And Ken, on the other hand, on the other side, is a former investment banker at both Japanese as well as international investment banks, and he's looking after the business and clinical executions. And our external board and aud auditors have vast experience in the field, so they're supporting us throughout the way. So thank you so much for your attention, and please consider joining our venture to revolutionize the way we treat heart failure. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would like to have some comments from the floor, so Dr. Koyanagi. Thank you very much. Uh, let me break the ice. Uh, by the way, I'm, I used to be work for the uh, University of Tsukuba and uh, have closer relationship with Metcell, so that's the, my COI. And then, uh, actually, I have a question about the business strategy, so JRM001, uh, uh, which is uh, you, uh, newly acquired from the other small companies, yes. right? So, which is very new for the Japanese startups. Mm -hmm. So that, was that um, kind of uh, surprising for you as a member of Nestle, or everybody was feeling like, oh, we have to go to the next stage and have to have the portfolio or something like that? How was the, if you can disclose the, right, right. the atmosphere? I think personally, I was, I didn't really know because I've never done MA myself. Um, so I didn't know how hard the process was going to be and what was the inclusion is going to be with the new members that was coming from JRM team. But after they joined, you know, they came with extensive experience in the field. So they've just been wonderful. And I think at the end of the day, it was just the perfect decision that we made to really acquire not just the pipelines, but the experiences that these people held um, so that we're now a better company with a stronger portfolio and stronger um, yeah, members. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you very much. So we'd we'll like to move on to the next presentation for the, due to the time constraints. So thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Okuno. Thank you very much. The last alumni speaker in this session is Dr. Tetsu Nagatomo, the board member of High Rank Inc., who took the stage of HBC Kyoto 2019. Thank you. So, thank you very much for preparing. So, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Tetsu Nagatomo from High Rank. Uh, so, thank you for the opportunity today to uh, present to you the uh, progress that we have made since uh, we first presented our efforts here at HBC uh, in uh, 2019. Um, as you might infer from our logo and the name of our company, um, we're a company focused on respiratory science. And so our progress has been closely intertwined with the recent COVID pandemic that has hit the world. Uh, while we had laid groundwork uh, from within the academia uh, before the pandemic hit, we never expected anything like that to happen. Um, when the pandemic actually hit, uh, it really accelerated the various uh, preparations that we had already conducted and had in place. And 
hopefully uh, building on top of those uh, various progress that we have made so far, uh, we will um, be able to uh, build on top of that and uh, smoothly transition into a post-COVID world. Sorry, I'm having difficulty with the pointer. Um, so prior to the COVID uh, pandemic hitting, um, we were trying to educate the market that respiratory deaths, uh, respiratory diseases, uh, comprises a huge chunk of uh, human health and human disease, as well as trying to convince the market or the uh, relevant stakeholders that respiratory therapeutics development has had a relatively low success rate compared to other uh, uh, therapeutic areas. And so, and part of the reason why, a major reason why uh, the success rate is low uh, is because the existing models that we have in terms of respiratory science and respiratory biology uh, doesn't necessarily uh, reproduce the human respiratory uh, biology and organ science uh, that is unique to human health. Um, Part of the reason why is because um, lung has actually been a difficult organ to study, and therefore, while compared to other organs which have already had various studies uh, being conducted, uh, lung has been a relative laggard compared to uh, other organs. And in contrast to that, uh, our, our originating team of Goto Yamamoto from Kyoto University's studies uh, have been uh, uh, globally uh, renowned as the uh, state of the art in terms of uh, lung science and respiratory uh, organ gen regeneration. So uh, basically our uh, cell uh, was to use that IPSC uh, derived respiratory cells, lung cells uh, and uh, airway cells, bronchial cells, uh, to enable a model that highly represents the human respiratory uh, biology. And uh, while we've been doing that, all of a sudden, uh, and then, by the way, along the way, yeah, sorry, uh, important, uh, we uh, had an opportunity to present uh, at the HPC Kyoto in 2019. We were actually one of the uh, three teams that were not necessarily incorporated by then. We were on the academic team, one of the three of the 18 total teams that uh, presented uh, on that occasion. Uh, we also had other opportunities to present, including one at the uh, San Diego, where Kyoto University uh, hosted a showcase of uh, various startups uh, originating out of Kyoto. And uh, these types of efforts uh, ultimately led to us uh, incorporating us to, uh, as a high lung. But uh, prior to that, this happened, uh, COVID. So it uh, brought us a uh, huge mortality at times, and in, in, in some countries, uh, larger numbers of death uh, than all other deaths combined uh, in normal years. Uh, but when it comes to COVID, the significance of the virus, significance of the disease is that it's a human respiratory infection. So what that means is that other animal models or even uh, subcellular models do not necessarily result in the types of uh, infection efficiency or infection, even infection itself, or the responses to those types of infections. So our human respiratory organoids, uh, these uh, tissue models, uh, will, uh, has, uh, has turned out to be a great uh, research tool on which to conduct uh, various research on COVID-19. As you can see, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you already know, uh, ACE2 and TIMPERS are the two markers uh, that are important for SARS-CoV-2 entry uh, into human cells. These are well represented in our IPSC-derived uh, respiratory organoids or in cells. And we have conducted various research around the globe, including this one, uh, which we conducted uh, with the Sanford Burnham Institute in San Diego. Of course, we've done collaborations domestically as well. Uh, this one is based on a paper that was recently published in Cell, uh, Journal Cell, uh, that uh, has been conducted in collaboration with uh, P Professor Kei Sato of University of, University of Tokyo. Um, and by the way, this study uh, teases out the material difference between the uh, Omicron subvariants. So uh, it's been a transition, uh, firstly from pre-COVID years where we had the HVC Kyoto presentation uh, through the pandemic and to the uh, post-COVID uh, era. 
Um, I happen to be an interim CEO uh, at the onset uh, because the inventor, uh, Yuki, Yuki Yamato, who, by the way, presented at uh, HVC Kyoto in 2019, uh, was uh, affiliated with the Kyoto University Hospital, and therefore there were conflicts of interest not only as a clinician, but also as, a, as an inventor of the technology. So I was responsible for incorporation of the company as well as uh, IP transition into the uh, new startup that uh, we uh, ultimately named as High Lung. Uh, I continue on as a director of business development mainly and responsible for uh, human resources as well as regulatory affairs whatnot. Um, and along the way, uh, we had to significantly ramp up our research capabilities as well as our cell plate manufacturing capabilities. Um, while doing so, um, it was uh, during the uh, COVID years, so um, we were not able to recruit, uh, uh, offer a recruitment to uh, wide swaths of people. But nevertheless, uh, one important factor of uh, residing in Kyoto is that uh, uh, there's a huge pool community of uh, cell biology experts here in Kyoto. And so we have had a successful uh, turns of uh, people joining our team and uh, thereby allowing us to significantly enlarge our uh, manufacturing capabilities. So we now produce uh, airway cell plates, uh, which are uh, adaptable to uh, high throughput purposes, as well as uh, alveolar lung uh, cell plates as well. And further coming up, um, we are involved in a federal, U.S. federal uh, pandemic preparedness uh, uh, projects, uh, which deal with uh, potential pathogens uh, that may arise uh, after this current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, because we uh, produce respiratory cells, not from biopsies or uh, necropsies, but from IPS cells, which can be scaled, uh, reproducible. Um, our, uh, we, uh, we consider, and uh, our partners consider ourselves uh, as a very uh, useful tool uh, that is scalable, reproducible, and predictive of human respiratory uh, infection uh, that is suitable for these types of pandemic preparedness, preparedness, sorry, the misspelling there, uh, in the coming years. Um, we certainly produce the cell plates. We also pr uh, produce cell organoids, which I'll just uh, briefly touch upon in the interest of time. Uh, we also have uh, these, uh, what are called organoids, which are small tissues uh, that mimic uh, human organs. Um, and they reproduce uh, various uh, human disease conditions, including in this one, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a rare disease is, that is very chronic, uh, difficult to treat. Um, and we offer uh, these types of assays uh, and uh, compare across various uh, pipeline agents or candidate uh, compounds and uh, predict uh, their efficacy uh, ultimately in uh, human uh, clinical use. Uh, obviously, because it's an organoid, uh, we can conduct uh, uh, various signal cell sequencing uh, to come up with deep phenotyping uh, efforts. Uh, we can also use these organoids for lung toxicity studies, uh, which have become increasingly concern, increasing concern for uh, various new oncologic anti-cancer agents. Uh, again, uh, toxicity slide, I'm just stabbing through. Uh, we're trying to come up with more complex, sophisticated uh, organ systems uh, called microphysiology systems. Um, and we have also implanted our uh, lung progenitor cells into mouse, and they have successfully regenerated into a mouse lung. So all in all, uh, we're trying to, oh, sorry, um, I just have to, um, yeah, so this is our team. Um, in fact, uh, majority of our team consists of uh, non-Japanese people, um, partly because of our interest in glo uh, expanding globally. Uh, so just, uh, just a summary of our slides. Um, sorry for just zapping through. Um, hopefully um, our uh, progress uh, has uh, been a lesson for our neighbors who might be interested in uh, and our endeavors. Um, so I'm, I'm Nagamoto, by the way. Um, I heard uh, Milanese uh, participants will be here. So uh, just to let you know, um, I'm not uh, Naga, uh, Nagatomo, but uh, I used to visit uh, Milan to watch him play at Inter Milan. So uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Sorry for running over the time. Um, hopefully, we can get to discuss more in detail after the session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nagamoto. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we have, uh, due to the time constraint, we have to skip the q and A's. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so next session is the in, uh, introduction, uh, the presentation from BioRabs, followed by the panel discussion between BioRabs and HBC mentors. First, Dr. Nina Datnix, yes please, from BioRabs, will provide a story on how to leverage the strengths of your biotech ecosystem. Thank you very much. So, yes, please prepare for the presentation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, please work. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Nina Datnik from BioRabs. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank. Uh, KRP, first and foremost, for inviting us, our very dear partners at JETRO, and uh, our friends at Kyoto University. So, I'm going to talk a little bit, take you on a bit of a journey, perhaps. The word ecosystem has come up quite a bit already today, and it's a word that we use all the time now. We throw this word out a lot. As a biologist, this used to really bother me because an ecosystem is a biological, right, ecological term. And when I started to really think about it, though, it started to seem like actually the very perfect word to use. As you think about this from a scientific perspective, an ecosystem is a collection of organisms interacting with an abiotic environment to share resources so that they all thrive. And that's actually exactly the kind of thing we're talking about when we think about what does it take to build innovation centers around the world. And it takes a lot of different kinds of organisms, different kinds of organizations and companies and different sectors all interacting with a built physical environment. So what are those key components? This is perhaps the billion dollar question that every municipality, every state, every prefecture, every country is chasing these days. Often this is the one that everybody thinks about. This is Kendall Square in the heart of Cambridge, Massachusetts, which has been cheekily referred to as the most innovative square mile on the planet which may very well be true. At one point about 10 years ago, somebody tried to count and there were 150 companies per square mile. Every major pharmaceutical company has a headquarters type building or research facility in Kendall Square. Novartis, Pfizer, Bayer, Behringer Ingelheim, as well as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Schlumberger, Akamai, across all sorts of different technological sectors, as well as somewhere over a thousand startups every year. This is what Kendall Square looked like a hundred years ago. <laughs> very, very different. 500 years ago, Kendall Square was more or less a swamp. And it was the way that you got from Boston to Harvard. That was it. A hundred years ago, these were the main products being manufactured in Kendall Square. As you can see, a, very, a mixture of, for the time, somewhat high-tech, something like steam boilers, perhaps, a lot of not very high-tech products, a lot of very basic products, paper, chalk, twine, glass, bricks, soap, this was the main industry of Kendall Square 100 years ago. And a couple of what has happened in the 100 years since to transform this location? This is, I think, to me, one of the most interesting questions we can ask. One thing that happened almost exactly 100 years ago was that MIT moved its campus from Boston to Kendall Square. And then there was a world war and all of these products were very integral to the World War. And then there was another World War. And by today, this is the main industries 
of Kendall Square. You can see actually candy still being manufactured in Kendall Square. Americans love candy. But everything else that was being manufactured in Kendall Square disappeared post-World War II. All of those other industries closed down. And now you can see an entirely different set of industries predominate in this area. So what changed? By the end of World War II, as I said, in the 1950s, almost all of those industries closed. There was not a huge demand anymore for bicycle tires and glass and brick being manufactured in Kendall Square. A couple of things happened. Nine, uh, President Kennedy decided that he was going to put the headquarters for NASA in Kendall Square, and they bulldozed a huge section of, the, of this neighborhood. There was n basically, you can see, there were almost no buildings for a huge part of this neighborhood. And then the U.S. government changed its mind and decided to put NASA in Houston, Texas. And so the, now Kendall Square had no industry and no buildings. <laughs> a couple of things happened. The city of Cambridge, MIT University, and a real estate developer came together to address this very urgent problem of how do we develop this empty universe, this empty neighborhood. And they came up and they came together with an urban renewal and development plan that they enacted over decades. So very far thinking for both the city and the university and the private sector to come together to do this. A couple of very important developments. In 1972, the very first paper was published on recombinant DNA technology. Harvard University, which is a couple of miles from this picture, wanted to start doing research in Cambridge. And the city of Cambridge and a lot of the public uh, population of Cambridge were very opposed to it. It was very scary, recombinant DNA. You're playing God. And so the city of Cambridge came together, held open public hearings, and ultimately adopted the very first ordinance in the United States to allow recombinant DNA experiments. One year later, Biogen was formed, the first biotech company in Kendall Square. One year after this piece of legislation was passed. A few years later, MIT changed its approach to how it did technology licensing. Now, historically, and sometimes even recent, in recent days, academic institutions don't always look kindly on commercializing technology, or in particular, professors starting companies. Historically, it was viewed with a lot of skepticism. Are you here to be a scientist, or are you here to make money? It was not that common, right? 1980, some of you may know, the United States passed the Bayh-Dole Act, which allowed universities, small companies, and nonprofit research institutions to commercialize and own um, technologies resulting from federally funded research. And so five years after that, MIT changed their approach to how they licensed out technologies developed with funding from the federal government, which has, over the last four decades, turned into an unbelievable machine within MIT to churn out companies based on its research. And they run programs, and I was the beneficiary of some of them, for everyone from undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, faculty members to start companies. There are competitions, there are training programs, there are courses, there are prize, there's prize money available at every level to help the members of that academic community become entrepreneurs. And one of the next biggest turning points was the, start, the arrival of multinational pharmaceutical companies. Novartis was the very first one. What you can see is it wasn't really that long ago. I moved to Boston. I moved to Cambridge in 2001. I was there before Novartis. In the intervening 20 years, every other pharmaceutical company in the world has some kind of physical presence in this neighborhood. So you can see this did not happen overnight, right? This is a 60-year process to go 
from a neighborhood that has no industry where only some small candy manufacturing is still going on to a neighborhood where right at the center of innovation for the world that everybody points to as the example. It did not happen overnight and it took a lot of people and entities and organizations and corporations working together to make it happen. So what can we learn from the ex experience of Kendall Square? At Biolabs, we think about what does it take to make successful life science innovation. We think about this all the time. And so we've developed our own model, which is probably pretty similar to many things that a lot of you have thought about as well. Who are the elements? What are, who are the stakeholders that are required? And we've just talked about many of them, right? First and foremost, whoops, come back. Right, we talked about academia. We talked about the generation of new ideas and technologies and new science. Also, a generator of a workforce. Somebody has to work at all of those biotech companies. Industry, right, we talked about the influx of the pharmaceutical companies, the development and the establishment of small to medium-sized biotech companies. To take those ideas out of academia and bring them to the world and to generate more workforce. So any startup that comes out of the university requires experienced people to run the company. We talked about government support. This is enormous. Just today, we've heard from multiple companies working on IPS cells. The difference in the regulation of IPS cells in the United States versus Japan is a very interesting policy situation, and potentially a very interesting aspect of advantage, competitive advantage for Japan over the United States. Other kinds of policies, right? We talked about the Cambridge recombinant DNA ordinance. Right? We talk about tax incentives. F many of the tax incentives that governments, municipal governments set up help really large pharmaceutical companies. But small startups can't take advantage of them. And so thinking about how does a government, a local government or a state or a prefecture government support startup companies? What do they need in terms of tax benefits or other kinds of economic incentives? and funding, of course. Governments are a wonderful source of financial support for the startup community. We talked about real estate. <laughs> At the end of the day, so everybody needs a physical location to do this work. You can, you can, we've all worked from home for the last two years, but there are some things you can't do from home. I have no PCR machine in my house. I can't put, right, we can't do science at home. You need physical space to be able to do this, but you need the right kind of physical space for every stage of development of an innovative company. A small startup company can't move in to 5,000 square meters of space on day one. You need the right space for the right moment. Obviously, you need an investment community. Right? We think about this all of the time. Who are the players that invest in startup companies? How do you find them? <laughs> and some cities have more of them than others. Right? In Cambridge, it is very possible to bump into venture capitalists every time you walk out the door. That's not true in every city, of course. And there's other sorts of service providers as well that make up this ecosystem. Um, if you are doing animal facilities, you need, right? You need animal facilities, you need other kinds of core facilities that you can't necessarily afford, and all sorts of other service providers. So, from our perspective at Biolabs, we think about this all the time because we think about what does it take not only to find places that contain all the right elements, but to bring them together. My experience is going from academic to entrepreneur is. It can be very hard, even in a place like Kendall Square, to meet the people you need to meet. You don't necessarily accidentally run into them. And so at Biolabs, our goal is to be a convener and a catalyst for those elements of the ecosystem. We are doing this in 14 loca 15 locations now around the world, 11 in the United States, three in Europe, and some early baby steps here in Japan, in Kawasaki with our friends at ICON, and here in Kyoto with our friends at Jetro. 
And we think about how to bring the ecosystem together on four levels. First and foremost, laboratory space. As I said, you can't do science at home. We run spaces so that scientists and entrepreneurs can focus on their science. We focus on everything else. Fully equipped with everything you need from a pipette to an HPLC to a tissue culture room. We run everything. You don't have to worry about regulations, environmental health and safety, waste management, etc. Our team that runs each site are an extension of your team as an entrepreneur. They've been there, they've done it, from science to entrepreneurship. It's a community of peers. Entrepreneurship can be unbelievably lonely. And so you need people like you who are doing this at the same time. And finally, a global network of all those other stakeholders, both locally and globally, to come together to find each other. Our one unofficial tagline at Biolabs is to reduce friction and increase collisions. We want you to run into each other because at the end of the day, everyone benefits. We have seen quite a bit of success with this model. These are a couple of examples of companies that have started with Biolabs and you can see just how quickly being in an environment like this that consolidates and condenses the ecosystem can accelerate your development as a startup. So I think this takes me to our panel discussion. I told you about the history of the last 100 years of Kendall Square. Obviously, Kyoto has a very different history and trajectory. The goal is not for Kyoto to be Cambridge. It can't be. Only Cambridge is Cambridge. And I promise you, Cambridge is not perfect. There are a lot of issues in Cambridge that are still left to be solved. The idea, really the question is, how does Kyoto become Kyoto? What are the strengths of the ecosystem here? How do you leverage those? Perhaps there are some ingredients that maybe are missing or less strong. How do we collectively, together, strengthen the elements that are here in Kyoto and the Kansai region to make it the best life science ecosystem that it can be? Not to make it Kendall Square, but to make it Kyoto. And with that, I will say thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, please remain on the sea. So next, move on to the panel discussion. So the HVC mentor will join the panel discussion. So please go on to the stage. Let me introduce the panelists. The panelists are the Dr. Nina Dapnik, who, who just presented, and Dr. Laura Stevens from BioRabs, and, if, and from HVC Mentors, Mr. Osami Kono from Kyoto University Innovation Capital, CORDD, and the moderator is Dr. Tomoyoshi Koyanagi from Kyoto University. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction, and uh, welcome all uh, to, the, uh, to the stage. Uh, my name is Tomo Koyanai from the Kyoto University Hospital. Uh, I used to work for the uh, University of Tsukuba, but before that, I was uh, in charge of the industry collaboration at Kyoto University Medical School. Around that time, 2016, uh, I, I requested uh, to have the joint uh, conference like uh, like this, and then uh, we started HBC Kyoto. So this uh, event is the purely focusing on the uh, to have training to pitch in English and deliver the business model or idea to the global company, and provide the chance to startup companies to expose to the uh, uh, the opinion by global company. So today's discussion. Uh, for uh, panel discussion, I want to ask uh, some of the startup companies uh, which uh, we already heard uh, today to, uh, to talk about their uh, strategy to go global. And also, I uh, want to ask the uh, BioLabs guys about their experience to work with not only US companies, but they also have the arm in, uh, in Europe. So their experience to work with the European startups 
And、uh, they also attended Wild Japan last week. So、uh, I want to ask about、uh, their impression about the Japanese startup companies. And eventually, I will ask Kono san from the Kyoto、uh, University Innovation Capital about、uh, their strategy、uh, to talk about the global expansion of their investees. So that's the, my idea.、Uh, but uh, uh, by the way,、uh, are they okay to unwear the mask? What do you think? When you, when you speak out, you can take. Okay? All right. So I want to ask、uh, who, who's going to start. So, probably they are, they are based on the、uh, yes, this sequence.、Uh, there's a、uh, s t a n from science. I want to ask you about、uh, your strategy to, to go global. Can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. So, you're asking strategy to go global? <laughs> That's a very good question. Difficult questions.、Uh, obviously, market is unfortunately outside of Japan. So, there are huge opportunities outside in the US or China or EU. So,、uh, that's one of the reasons we start to think about okay, even we have a good technology, we have to deliver this to the patients who are really seeking all therapies, right? Then we have to bring it, otherwise, You know, we would be wasting our effort and actually technology. That's what we thought. Then, okay, then how to? This is very difficult,、uh, actually, things. So, we've been actually struggling for many years.、Um, you know, we did pitch, pitch presentation here in the HBC. Then, also, we did lots of,、uh, we got lots of invitations from outside. Then, we just went there to present. But, you know,、uh, try to get support from Japanese VC was not quite sufficient.、Mm. Um, the reason is probably there are many re- reasons, but they are asking us when you're going to get, you know, phase one, when you're going to get clinical trials, even though we are still very early pre clinical stage. We, are, we need money to get IND, but they're asking f- you know, further results. So then,、uh, also, the amount of money was unfortunately not big enough to go. Then we decided to talk to people outside of Japan. Then,、um, also, we've been spending about f- four years to actually develop our technology, solid, and also. Com- then, Probably time was good. Then, when we talked to actually A Prime or A Pros, those guys are really happy to invest us. Then、uh, we just, that's the way we approached. I see. Thank you very much. So, yeah, now one of the keywords、uh, could be the Japanese VC is not great enough to support,、uh, well, You say that. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> My impression, <laughs> something like that. But, but at least、uh, um, that is the very、uh, important point because,、uh, well, investors are investors. Even uh, US uh, venture capital also has the limited support for the clinical stage. But uh, they, uh, in the ecosystem,、uh, probably you know, like、uh, in Boston, we have a lot, you guys have a lot of different、uh, t y p e of the support, not only the, what we have in Kyoto. So we have to expand. I, I should add, actually,、uh, when we are very small, actually, local investors really supported us, including Kyoto ICAP, also several actually investment com-、uh, investors here in Kyoto. So that was really helpful. I, I would like to say thank you to all, all people invested early stage. Yeah, that's very important. Yes, yeah. So, we, after five years of the HBC Kyoto, I'm feeling like the, the support, type of the support has to be changed or、uh, has to be grown,、uh, go to the next step. Okay,、uh, let's move on to the.、Uh, I want to ask、uh, Ami Okuno san about、uh, your, well, not only just m e t s e l your own experience.、Uh, I, actually, the, we,、uh, we went to、uh, UC San Diego together and have an interviewing session、uh, with the doctors at UC San Diego hospitals. 
Yeah, so we've p actually participated in HVC uh, in 2019, and we also participated in the Tsukuba University's research studio program. So these acceleration programs that really runs in English help us mentally prepare for you know going to the U.S. and actually going to the U.S. to San Diego with the research um, studio was really, really a big step for us in figuring out the difference in the medical care and medical standards in the U.S. as well as in Japan. So we um, really learning from the physicians in the U.S. gave us a lot of ideas and that, you know, it, the medical system is really, really different. So those were a good findings for us, and obviously COVID-19 was kind of a big hurdle for us to move into the U.S. physically. So we are yet to have our office and our, have our footing in the U.S., but we're really looking forward to expanding our business in the next few years, and hopefully it will be in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Do you have a comment? Go ahead. So, I left Cambridge a year ago <laughs> <laughs> and moved back to my hometown of Chicago. And I want to say that it's really, I, I spoke about Cambridge on purpose today, but I, I need to tell you that Cambridge is very unique. <laughs> Even Chicago has more in common with Kyoto as an innovation ecosystem than it does with Cambridge. So I think it's really important for all of us to think bigger than Cambridge and also to be a little more sympathetic to ourselves because it's very different. I think we're, on, as Biolabs, we are now operating in France and in Germany and 10 cities that are not Cambridge. <laughs> and there are more similarities once you leave same Cambridge, San Francisco, and San Diego amongst all of us it's much harder to raise the same kinds of money in a place like Chicago or Dallas or can, can, you know, New Haven, Connecticut than it is in Boston. It's a totally different game. And so I think we cannot judge ourselves based on the standards of Cambridge, Massachusetts alone and think about what are different metrics, but also I think sort of this is why we have to think more globally. So startups that are based in Chicago can't raise the kind of money either if they only focus on Chicago. This is, I think, why it's important to have local ecosystems and, at the same time, these kinds of global interconnected ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Global interconnected community. Yeah, that's great. Because, um, yeah, this, uh, this event is actually the, one of the uh, memorable uh, events uh, to tie it up with the people from the Milan. So, yeah, that would be great. If you can have uh, any comment, I will ask you later. Uh, but before that, I want to ask Nagamoto-san about uh, what, you, what about uh, um, uh, your experience and also the, the planning and, and also I so I'm so impressed because the, they are actually the uh, medical doctors who is run uh, who has the experience to run business too so uh, they have very strain. Um, so uh, my background, by the way, happens to be MD, but nevertheless has had a longer experience in the business side. So if you're interested in my personal background, um, I can probably talk to you more about that later. But uh, to get back to the point of um, our experiences and our uh, aspirations towards the global market, I think I will add two things. Um, firstly, I think um, Kyoto has a strong uh, community of uh, non-Japanese scientists uh, who, have, who have come here uh, both to study as well as to work and conduct research, uh, in particular in the uh, cell biology space where Yamanaka-san and all the others uh, have had, had a deep experience and the strength in terms of their science and technology and research. Uh, and so while it was partly our choice to actually uh, welcome uh, non-Japanese uh, researchers to our team, it was just simply the fact that uh, of the pool of the people that are already residing in Kyoto, there already are many non-Japanese people. And therefore, when we try to operate on the global stage, uh, those diversity within our team helps us very much in expanding our R&D base beyond Kyoto and beyond Japan. So that's one thing. 
Um, I think the other thing is that the, um, while there are many pharma companies who have their business development outposts, uh, particularly around uh, Kyoto University, but also here at KRP, that very much helps, and not least because, you know, as, uh, as physicians and scientists, they mostly tend to deal with, the, I don't want to be a majority of anything, but they mostly deal with uh, pharma marketing reps and not necessarily the uh, business development personnel. Um, so having exposure to business development uh, personnel in Kyoto helps the physician scientists in Kyoto a whole lot. Having said all that, uh, when you want to conduct actual research and development, uh, we need to co-locate with uh, pharma R&D research centers. And that, uh, at least on the face of it, is not necessarily Kyoto. Uh, many of the farm companies have their R&D headquarters elsewhere in Japan or elsewhere on the grow, globe. And, and the many of the companies that we are, in fact, in co contact with and are uh, in negotiations with having uh, early investigative R&D in collaboration with us uh, tends to be majority European and some American. So when those types of uh, collaboration research do materialize, I think that will be a one trigger for us to actually expand beyond the vicinities of Kyoto and likely in Europe or in the US, West Coast likely. Uh, but uh, that I think those types of uh, joint R&D is a significant uh, threshold over which uh, we will consider uh, establishing an outpost overseas. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, but before that, probably the, uh, the corner sign you about to say something. You have mic. Are you okay? Then, okay. Then, Nina, you have some comments. Sorry, I have a question for you yeah. uh, to follow up. <laughs> Am I breaking the rules? That's okay. The no um, which comes first? Is it chicken or egg? Do you co locate with pharma? so that you can set up R&D collaborations, or do you set up the R&D collaboration and then co-locate? As you said, that is a huge chicken and egg problem. That's a $64 million question. <laughs> um, probably. Um, so I think from our standpoint, at least uh, as if we base our operations mainly on cell manufacturing side of things, um, it will be more to the former in the sense that once we have a partner, we can move on. Um, prior to having a partner, it's not necessarily a prerequisite uh, for us to have a manufacturing facility overseas as of yet. Although depending on, for instance, how our uh, pandemic preparedness engagement works, we may have to significantly ramp up our production base and that it may actually enable us uh, and makes sense for us uh, to have a manufacturing base in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, let me comment on that because you know now when I work at the, well, I, I I'm now working at Kyoto, and then many pharmaceutical guys requested me to have a meeting on Friday, Friday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> want to go out uh, for for dinner or something to enjoy the, the discussion. So that's very important. So we have to reinvent. The way of the collaboration, probably the co-locate is very important. Uh, so many pharmaceutical companies used to locate in Osaka, but they left. And then in Tsukuba, we also had uh, many pharmaceutical companies uh, still locating there, but no, very few collaboration happened. So uh, the type of collaboration uh, is now changing. In addition to the uh, yeah the COVID-19 communication, so we we can uh, reinvent or redefine uh, how what is the collaboration and what is the co-location means or something like that. Okay, so I move. Uh, I want to ask Laura about uh, every time when I when we have the Zoom meeting, uh, you also have the like plan to go to Europe sometimes, and then, yeah, eventually you now in Japan. So uh, you know, what about you to think about uh, the, how the international collaboration? And also, I want to uh, ask you about your uh, experience to work with the European companies, too. Yeah, so what I would say is when we think about global expansion, expansion outside of your own national borders, whether it's Japan or Europe, it's really about communication, right? How do you tell your story? So. 
Everyone in this room knows there's great science that happens in Japan, there's great science that happens in France, there's great science found worldwide. How do you communicate that story to non-scientists? Because remember, a lot of investors are non-scientists. Mm -hmm. Talking about the nitty-gritty technical details makes scientists in the room, myself included, as a scientist, very happy. However, we lose our non-scientific audience. What do they want to know? They want to know, how are you going to commercialize your technology? What is the problem you're trying to solve and why should I care? And this is true of French companies. This is true of the Japanese companies that we have worked with. It's really about, it's true of companies outside of Cambridge, quite frankly. Oh, it's true of some companies in Cambridge. And true of companies <laughs> in Cambridge. The ones who succeed are the ones who tell their story in the way that attracts the right investor, investment. Um, we even said this in academia when I was there. It's all about how you sell your science. If you can't sell your science well, you won't get good grant money. If you can't sell your concept for your technology well, you aren't going to get investment funding. So when we think about biolabs expanding and pulling together the ecosystem about us developing educational programs for entrepreneurs, as we've done with Jetro many times, we spend quite a lot of time on communication strategies and how to network, how to pitch, how to tell your story. Mm -hmm. Tell the story. Mm -hmm. That's important. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> So, um, if possible, I want to ask uh, the, the delegates from the Milan about uh, what's your impression about how we, international collaboration uh, between the, uh, the ecosystems. So, yeah, if you have any comments, uh, I want to ask you to speak out. Okay. Thank you. This is the reason for our being here in the sense that, as I said before, I appreciate a lot your presentation, particularly saying that uh, everyone has to be wo who he himself is, not another one. But uh, for being myself, I need others. So in sense, also is a network, a community, which is really the engine for um, global growth. Mm -hmm. What we think is, or in Spanish, consider that we are in some sense a startup because we started after the Expo in 2015, and the first stone for the Human Technopoland Research Center was established in, 20, in 2018. So we are in any, in, in, under any aspect and start up in some sense. But our experience stemming from the experience of the Expo is that the connection between institutions mm -hmm. is crucial. It's not sufficient because it's not a matter, but also for business, uh, having a good relationship with the institutional framework is absolutely key. Because particularly in this field, in life science, because regulatory are all in the public institutions, for instance, in, Lom in Italy, the healthcare system is regulated and managed by the regional governments. Mm. So the 21 regional governments of Italy, not from the national state. The national government, yes, produces guidelines, but the really key, re this is for instance the reason why Illumina, which is a big company, United States based, decided to come to mind. Mm because they see a very good opportunity of market, of course, and a connection with the regional system, which is the leader in Italy, and one of the leading in Europe. So our vision is the framework of the institution is not sufficient, but crucial. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, talents. So create attractiveness for talents, in the sense that, of course, the resources for the innovation, the research are, uh, are talents. And young talents particularly, because the innovation comes from, uh, from young people, <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. This is the physical innovation, so, and probably we are to be that. So these are two elements. In the international network, 
is really possible to experiment in a better way what does it mean cooperate to compete. So that really competition mm -hmm. is based on a capacity of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we have to seek the, well, the all healthcare issues happening in the local. So that, for example, like a regional government control is very, very important in Japan too. But uh, the healthcare issue itself in, in Italy is a little different from what we have in Japan and Nairu uh, from, from US. So uh, we have to collaborate and find out a good solution to resolve those problems. Thank you very much. And then before, uh, so time is running out. I'm very sorry for all management on time. Uh, before that, I want to ask Kono-san about your experience uh, from the five years of the mentoring about HVC Kyoto and any kind of comments if you have uh, after this. Just discussion. show comments. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, um, seven or eight, eight years ago, there was a very, very poor circumstances for startups in Kyoto University. No startups from Kyoto University doing business after Japan, but now, I'm very, very pleased to he see that, uh, uh, like Sayas, some startups now challenging to ask Japan, like Sayas, or another one pharmaceutical startup, Digest Storm, is now doing a phase one clinical trial in Australia, and phase two will start uh, next year in United States. And uh, this is not a uh, uh, life science startup, but uh, Kyoto Fusion, Fusion Earring is, is nuclear fusion power startup. Uh, it is now established uh, uh, their office outside Japan, and and it, I think it, this this proves that uh, ki kind of ecosystem in Kyoto University have worked for these several eight years. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, fortunately we could be a part of the the growth of the Kyoto ecosystem and uh, try to expand to the to the global network anyway yeah thank you very much for the cooperation to all panelists and uh, please give the warm uh, approach to them thank you very much for the powerful and encouraging intensive discussion please go on to the uh, return to your seat so yes it's really a powerful and encouraging discussion so please do continue this discussion at the networking session Thank you very much for the panelists. In closing for today, Ms. Atsuko Kadowaki, the president of Kyoto Research Park, will give the closing remarks. Yes. Ms. Kadowaki, please come to the podium. Now, so please give a warm welcome to Ms. Kadowaki. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Atsu Kadowaki from Kyoto Research Park. Today, we have uh, about 170 participants. Uh, we, uh, today, we have about 170 participants. And I'd like to express my, uh, my sincere gratitude to all of you. Thank you very much. Arespo, the operator of Milano Innovation District and the KLP are located in the rare cities where tradition and innovation have coexisted for over a millennium. And we have signed an MOU to remain sources of cutting edge industry. I really appreciate and expose delegates for this, their attendance to this event. Thank you, Alberto san and Mercedes san And we are much honored to have a precious opportunity to hear directly from BioLabs, which has built the world's best life science ecosystem. Thank you for joining us, Nina san and Lola san. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, Hitoshi san from SAYAS, Okamoto san from Metsero, and Nagamoto san from Highland. As mentioned in the opening remarks, HBC Kyoto is going forward to the main event next 
its main event next summer. We look forward to the participation of startups who have committed to bring the great research findings of academia to patients around the world, like our alumni today. The application guideline will be available in next February, and we look forward to your active participation. We accept partnership application from companies looking for new technology all the time. In closing, closing, I'd like to ask for your cooperation in the continued development of HVC Kyoto. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Kadowaki. From now on, we would like to have a networking session until, six, until 4 p.m. at the venue. But before leaving, please scan the QR code the, um, and the answer the questionnaire. Please, could, you, could you protect that? Yes, here is the questionnaire. So please answer this questionnaire before leaving. So, and now, and the archive movie of today will be available on YouTube, so we will announce the URL on PDX, so please check back later for more information. And lastly, the awareness symposium will be held in December as another HVC post event. Please look forward to an outstanding panel discussion and that will bring together key players from industry and government and academia as well as some future startups. So this is the end of today's event. Thank you again for, the, for your participation to HBC Kyoto Post event today. And have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you.